And I thought I would begin, since many of you saw the debate, we want to talk about secrecy and we want to talk about much of the material that's in his new book, but I'd like to get your impressions from what you saw this evening, particularly in light of what you have pretty much brought into light in your most recent book. I hope you all can hear if you can't holler. You know, it, uh, can you all hear? I mean, I, I, I have a sense you can't all. Okay, if there's a problem, yell. Don't be passive. Um, essentially, it doesn't matter that, he, that Bush scares the hell out of me. What really matters is that he scares the hell out of a lot of very important people in Washington who can't speak out in the, in the military, in the intelligence community. Uh, they, know, um, they know in ways that you know, none of us know the, the, sort of the, the, the incredible gap between what is and what he thinks. And so, um, uh, I, I'm not minimizing, I wouldn't for a second minimizing what, minimize what I do, but the fact of the matter is, I, I've been doing an alternate history of the war from inside, because people, since, since right after 9-11, because people inside, and there are a lot of good people inside, are scared, as scared as anybody watching this, I think, tonight should be, because this guy, um, if he is reelected, has only one thing to do. He's going to bomb the hell out of that place. And he's been bombing the hell out of that place. And here's what really irritates me about, again, to get into the press. Since, since he set up this, this Potemkin Village government uh, with Mr. Olawe in June 28th, the bombing, the daily bombing raids inside Iraq have gone up exponentially. There's no, any, there's no public accounting of how many m missions are flown, how much ordinance is dropped. We have no accounting and no demand to know. And the only sense you get is we're basically in a full-scale air war um, against mythical people that we can't find, we don't have no intelligence about, so we bomb what we can see. Where's the press? Oh, man, I don't know. It's, this is a tough one because I, I was saying before that I, I've been speaking a lot. Um, I, I usually keep, I usually play the game of just uh, when I have a piece in the New Yorker, I do interviews, and the rest of the time I sort of keep my mouth shut um, about what I think. But this is different now. And um, I can tell you, I, I've been speaking to crowds like this for three or four weeks since my book was published. And the same passion, you know, even in conservative areas, even, even in... in in the middle of Ohio, there's a lot of, lot of worry. Um, and there's a great deal of anger at the press, particularly among people who don't like Bush, especially among people, but not all, not, it goes the other way. Um, there's a, the press says, I think this is gonna go down as one of the classic sort of failures. And I think we were all frightened off. I think many of the press were, you know, the New York Times, the Washington Post. I can only give you a guess, Michael. I, I think they were frightened off by 9-11. I think we just, we fell into the trap. But when you say people, even who work in military and intelligence, are frightened by this president, it's not only the bombing that will continue and that will be escalated, presumably, if he is reelected. It's much more, I suspect, than that. Your sources tell you. Well, this is a war of ideology. And you, you see, I think it's real simple to say he's a liar. Um, or would be that there was a lie that he understood because it would also suggest that there was a reality he understood. I think the really serious, and it's, it, it, it is funny in sort of a sick black humor way, the real serious problem is he believes what he's doing. He is prepared, as he, as he told Bob Woodward, if, it, if he's reelected, he's gonna, he's, gonna, he's gonna have to win this war. And by the way, it's painful to hear uh, Kerry talk of this war is not winnable. It's over. We're, we're, this is a disaster that's been going on. It's a civil war. Uh, the insurgency is, is just not winnable. There's no win anymore in this war. And as I've been... Yeah. Isn't it amazing? It's an applause line that means more American boys die. And that's the conundrum we all have, you know, as the deaths mount. This man is going to, if he's reelected, He's going to carry the war because I think he believes in democracy. You heard him say that three or four times as one of his mantras. And the fact that he believes it means he's willing to risk his reputation. I think he sees that I don't know whether this is because he's a crusader, whether it's born, a uh, born-again thing, or whether it's, he's been converted by Wolfowitz and the other neoconservatives into this sort of phantasmagorical um, 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 madness that they, they see. They see democracy. 
Somehow democracy, and by the way, yeah, democracy is important, but if you look at the history of democracy, it's a pretty bloody one too. You know, there, there, there's nothing wonderful per se. The democracies don't mean an end to war. Anyway, certainly not. Um, uh, so uh, this is a guy who is going to escalate the war if he's elected. I can't tell you if he's going to, he's, he's got a military that's frayed. I, I don't know how he can avoid compulsory, but maybe he'll just keep it going. I don't know if I, I'm, I'm talking about the draft now. He may just stick it to us in the draft. He certainly can't have an election there in January. Um, that's, everybody knows that's hopeless. So what he's going to do is, as I said, bomb and rest. And, and if, when the body bags come and they get to be 2,000 or 3,000, he's going to take that price because he sees himself as, as, the, as the guy in the white hat. He sees himself as virtuous. It's ideology. It's, he's an ideologue. He's an idealist, you could say. He's a utopian. Um, I said, um, I called him in effect, this is over intellectualizing, you can't say this about Bush, you can say it about Wolfowitz, he's a Trotskyite, he believes in permanent revolution, um, but, but um, the fact is, uh, he's also mad in, in the classic sense, he's mad, he's mad in that it's an insane proposition he's offering us. There is no sanity to the policy, the policy, the war is done. The insurgency has won the war, and the only question is, I'll, I'll give you a, uh, uh, if you want me to. I'm I don't know away what you're with, offering. What, uh, I'll, give you, I'll give you an alternative, um, uh, a heuristic alternative in, interpretation of the Zakari stuff, okay? Um, Zakari, you all know, there's been stories in the last week when the intelligence community is finally saying publicly what a lot of us, a lot of, a lot of, it's been said repeatedly for two months, Zakari is not everywhere. He's a Jordanian. He's not a, a, he's not a Fedayeen. He, there's no way he would be in Fallujah. They simply, the, uh, the insurgency would not let an outsider in there. And so what has the insurgency done in the last two or three months since Alawi got in? They have taken the war, and I, by the insurgency, don't forget, it's a tribal country. It's not all Sunni Shiite splits. Many of the tribes are 50-50, are literally, close to in terms of Sunni Shiite. There's a lot more communication than you think, about which, by the way, we have no intelligence. A year and a half ago, the problems we had that led to Abu Ghraib is they were operating in two and three man uh, uh, cells, the insurgency. We couldn't penetrate. Now my friends tell me it's 10, 15 man cells and we still can't penetrate. As somebody said, we're playing chess, they're playing go. And we're, you know, we, can't, we can't cut it. In the case of Zakari, what the insurgencies decided to do, mostly led by the Ba'athists, a lot of people think, and though it's very hard to really know, they've decided to wage war against their own population. They have to keep, the, there's no jobs in this society. It's part of the insanity of this administration. They also decided to privatize Iraq. That's Bremer's story. Bremer was brought in to privatize Iraq. They were gonna take all the socialistic programs, all the state-owned programs and sell them off. I presume if you did a lot of work, you could find off, sell off to certain friends, Republicans, et cetera. But the important thing is most of the jobs, job, the job market disappeared. The reason why Bush can talk about 100,000 people wanting to go work in the police or in the army is there's nothing else for them to do. They're willing to stand in line and get bombed because they want to take care of their family. In any case, the, 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 the insurgency is taking the war to the people. It's a huge step, enormous consequences. At the time they did it, suddenly we're flooded with walk-ins, what they call people coming in with intelligence, linking Zakari to all the bombing and also linking um, you know, uh, Al-Qaeda and the president, of course, and this administration went for a hook, line, and sinker. An outside agitator is doing the bombing when in fact, what, what has really happened is the insurgency has done a very brilliant thing. They, you know, this is, the insurgency has simply deflected what they're doing onto this man. And we fell for it. I think we're so out of it. Do you follow what I'm saying? I do. In fact, it prompts me to ask you if we have gone out of our way not only to pay for, but to suffer and pay the consequences for trying to get intelligence that in so many instances turns out to be bad intelligence, not worth whatever we're paying for it. I mean, certainly in your book you point out that many of the prisoners in Guantanamo, many of the so-called Taliban, didn't belong there. They weren't Taliban. They were sold, in fact, as, as people like Mark Danner have pointed out. They, somebody would point the finger and say, this is a Taliban, and we bought it, and we're buying intelligence that's pretty useless, too, from the sounds of it. I, I think we're going to find, when one of the things the Supreme Court has done, um, it has started a process in which um, uh, we, we are forced now to begin to differentiate prisoners. One, one of the great violations of the Geneva Convention was everybody was arrested. Many of them ended up in Guantanamo, where they stayed for six years, and there was no, no attempt to find out 
whether they had anything to do or not. And this was known, I write about this, it was known very early to Condoleezza Rice, et cetera. It's another horror story, just another day. Um, no, and but not acted on for a well, longest period of time. Well, not acted on, but actually when we're all done, to our shame, we're going to find that Guantanamo is going to be our Andersonville, our, you know, our Civil War prison. That's going to be, it's a horror prison. I've learned much more since in the last month even. It's a horror prison beyond any, what went on there is beyond any, you, you know, you say to yourself, um, um, my parents were immigrants. They came here because America meant something. There was, you, you fled from Eastern Europe from whatever the oppression was. You came here, the Statue of Liberty, all that stuff. Because America always was a bastion of morality and integrity and a place for a fresh start. In three years, in front of us, right in front of us, not hidden, they've taken this away from us. And it's gone down with enormous passivity, not only among my peers, but surely not here, people here, but generally we've accepted. And what makes you, you have to say to yourself, how can eight or nine cultists, neoconservatives, come and take down this government, bring us on this path, convince the president that was not a neoconservative, he was a realist, so was a Cheney, so was Rumsfeld, convince them after 9-11 that the way to solve the problems of terror is to go through Baghdad, and they, in doing so, they overran the bureaucracy, uh, they overran the Congress, um, they, they overran the press, and they overran the military. So you say to yourself, how fragile is this democracy? How close are we to the edge of something much worse, one of those ocracies? You know, one of those, you know, and the, I'm not talking about fascism necessarily, but um, uh, we really are in trouble. And how close are they in Iraq to theocracy, which, uh, as I think you pointed out when we talked on Wednesday, uh, Rumsfeld and company felt pretty adamantly opposed to and wanted to intervene in any way they could to stave it off. Well, the game plan was, the way it was sold to all of us, and there is, of course, there's no memory. And of course, you know, in America, there's no memory, there's no consequences, and there's no learning from experience. That's the givens, if you're in the government. You're sort of safe. And so, um, uh, unlike other societies, and what the simple thing was, the idea was democracy. These guys thought they could come in, you know, what, and there were huge fights inside the bureaucracy. And here's where the military gets interesting. The military wanted to go in, military didn't want to go in. The military, you know, I have a, I have a four-star friend who was involved at the highest level, and he once said about Madeleine Albright, he'd worked for years at the, in, 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 the, in the meetings, he said, you know, in, in six years of being around her when she was Secretary of State and also at the UN, she, he said there never was a country or person she didn't want to bomb at some point, you know? <laughs> and so in general, the military, the smart guys in the military know what it means. Uh, Military guys understand something, the smart ones. You don't treat prisoners any differently than you want your prisoners to be treated. You don't get good intelligence by coercion. If you have a bunch of people that are willing to fly airplanes in to, 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 you know, to, to, to kill the infidels, to kill us, you're not going to torture them into giving you information that's reliable. I mean, it's just, it's a given. I, I, it, I can't tell you um, well, how this administration thinks. I think, I think they're very paranoid. I think Bush, Cheney are really you know, you can explain it by a high degree of paranoia, um, but uh, I can't answer about, I, I don't have, I don't have a sense of, uh, I don't have a sense of how they could do it. I don't have a sense of how history will look at these years and, and look at all of us and say how we cope with this. I don't think it's going to be good. Um, What's, and I want to make an announcement actually before I follow up with that. Um, David Weir handed me this note to please announce those of you who have questions, because we will have a Q&A segment of this talk with Cy Hirsch, uh, write them down on the card that should be at your seat or pass the blank ones on to others and we'll collect the cards from the ends of the rows and bring those questions forward uh, toward the end. What would be the best, well you've said there's no, that, that the war is over as far as you're concerned, the insurgency is no, won. No, as far as the people I talk to who know more about the war than most people, really. Then what's the, what's the best that we can hope for in the way of some kind of an exit strategy or some kind of way of getting out of there? Well, I, I think the one thing that Kerry should do is he should try and change the, the, the dialogue, should try and change the terms. Instead of stuff talking about winning, and you know, the, you know uh, look, I'm, Kerry's moving, obviously. He's moving, his position is moving. He's, he's, it's a moving target. And you see, one thing you do understand is how intelligent he is. You can see it now, I mean, um, and he is, he is, he is very smart, um, very unlikable, but very smart. And, um, um, and so 
he understands a lot. He, I, 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 I'm not gonna, I can't begin to, I stay away from those guys, so I don't know what they're thinking. But he is moving. The idea that you can um, uh, somehow uh, sustain a, the Alawi government, let, let me just tell you, when the war began, I started to say this, democracy was promised. And it's, you all remember the story, the, the numbers, the, the, the Shiites, the Shiites who suffered brutally at the hands of Saddam welcomed us up to a point. There was a general sense of happiness that the Americans came in, a lot of worry from the very first hour about us sticking around too long. That was always there in the first day. But they welcomed us because they did believe in the, you know, we said one man, one vote, there's 60% of the population, there we go. And Rumsfeld said right away, we'll do anything but have an Islamic government. So he, you know, he, he, he made it clear that it was democracy, but on our terms. And so what we're now doing is now, you know, I always worry about, I'm interested in words. Um, uh, somebody mentioned sports. Marty Nolan, of the, 10 words. Marty Nolan of the, of the Boston Globe once wrote about baseball, and he said, the, uh, the Red Sox killed my father, and now they're coming after me. <laughs> so words, words are really interesting. And so, um, in 10 words, insurgency, Here's the thing about insurgency that really intrigues me. So you're the, you're the Shiites. You've been in this intracted, bitter war with Saddam for years. The Dawah party tried to kill him. That's all part of various factions. And you haven't been allowed to practice your religion. Um, the Americans come in, promise you one man, one vote, don't give it to you. And then they install a guy named Iyad Alawe, who? is a Shiite, he's what they call a white Shiite, he's not religious, who was inside when, when Saddam, here's, I get, here's where I get mad at, at some of the press, they should tell you more about Charlie Dolfer, the guy that did the report. Charlie Dolfer was an inside guy for the Americans inside UNSCOM. He was considered by many of the members of the UNSCOM, the United Nations team, to be a complete patsy for the United States. He was virulent in his hatred of Saddam all the way, which is rational, I guess, if you're in there. But Charlie Dolfer does not bring a clean tabula risa. It's not Charlie Dolfer assigned by the CIA to do this, and his view is wonderful. Charlie Dolfer goes and finds out what he knows. He's known for a long time. They all on the inside knew after 95, 96, there wasn't much there. And what he does is he writes a report that says that, but he also gives them an out. He writes a, a, a fanciful notion that Saddam, if he would have, could have, he would have, you know, done it. You know, um, um, you know uh, it, it's the equivalent of a teenage wet dream. And that's what, he, that's what he's selling. And he's selling that in a, in a report, and it's given it out to these guys. And he's not presented by the press as somebody who, if you looked into his background, you would discover that, among other things, and this is, there are people who have written about this, not only me, Bart Gelman of the Washington Post, there was a period after 96 when, the, when we continued the inspections because basically Saddam became convinced that we were trying to assassinate him, that the, the, the United States CIA had taken over the United Nations in, uh, invest, UNSCOM and had perverted it. And guess what? They had. They had. The CIA had undercut the United Nations and was running a basically get Saddam operation on the inside. And how did they know? They know because, you know, Iraqis have very good intelligence. They can eavesdrop. And they have Dolfer. They've had Dolfer for years saying things on tape. And so, you know, it, uh, Charlie's a nice guy. He wrote a, uh, half that report is wonderful. The part, it's the only part I resent about it is not presented in context. Neither is Alawi. Alawi, when the Shiites were dying and killing, and, and somebody asked me, I'm always asked about the morality. Was it moral to go in? I mean, there, there is, an, is there a moral, moral argument? This is one of the devil's advocate I, I get, um, positions I get. Was it moral, forgetting Bush, forgetting Kerry, the idea that Saddam was a torturer and a killer and ran, did a horrible, horrible things, doesn't that, doesn't that lend a patina anyway of morality going after him, whether the UN was there or not? And so the answer to that one is, of course, is, oh yeah, I got it. Saddam tortured and killed his people, and now we're doing it. So that's the morality. So you have all, you know, it's, it's a no-win argument for anybody, but in any case, about Alawi, so all during um, uh, the 80s and 90s, when the Shiites were in war with Saddam and getting brutalized by him, he's in London uh, working for two or three or four intelligence services, not only us, the Brits, the Israelis, he worked for a lot of people. 
He was also an inside man. And everything I'm telling you is friggin' empirical. It's there. It's there for reporters to find out. He was an inside man. Saddam took the party over, the Ba'ath Party from inside, a brutal society. He killed his way up with the aid of a, of a, of a, of a general named Shakur that, that eventually headed the Makabarat, the Iraqi intelligence service, you know, the old torture rack or whatever you will. Um, um, and, and the number three guy, or the, the third among equals, um, was, was Alawi. He was very loyal to Saddam through the middle 60s until the, until the middle 70s. He then ends up in London going to med school. I don't know if he finished or not. The story is he did. I don't know. But he's also running happily for years. He's, he's sort of the foreign. He's involved with the Makabarat Foreign Division going after any people in the diaspora outside who are critical of the, of the, of the regime. Wham, wham, bam. And he's in, I can't tell you he's personally, but I, I wrote a piece in which I quoted somebody in the agency by CIA, a CIA guy by name saying he's got blood on his hands and four or five other guys saying that they read the files. He's a very bloody, nasty piece of work. Whatever happened, he was, there was an attempted assassination of him in 76, but it wasn't about ideology. I don't know what it was about. I have a guess about money. But in any case, um, he's, he is known to the Shiite world as absolutely useless in terms of offering anything. He's Saddam light. He's, um, as I said, he's in the Cold War terms. He's, you know, he's a puppet. He's just the a puppet. Shiites and the Sunnis view him as really essentially our merit. Uh, oh, we're, there's no question. He's got absolutely. We're the no puppeteers. But yet he comes and he goes before Congress. Well, the Bush administration is. Mm -hmm. He goes before Congress and they stand up and applaud him. And you know, and there's no journalism about this, and that drives me nuts. And it's there. Believe me, it's there. It's there in the London press. It was there in the New Yorker. It's there in other places. It's there. And you're not getting it. And it, uh, that's very distressing to me. Let's speculate as to why. I mean, there's been that chill since 9-11 and the fearfulness of the press to go after the Bush administration. But since we're talking about secrecy today, I'm also mindful of the fact that secrecy play and, and lack of access plays a big role in this. And obviously, I'm prompted to ask you, since you have been through seven administrations as an investigative reporter and journalist, I mean, I was reminded when David Weir was talking about Bush's gestures tonight, I remember Nixon's gestures when he used to say, you know, we must come together or we are going to the top or those kinds of things. <laughs> and you get that same kind of double speak from, from Bush. When you look back at Vietnam and you look at the Nixon administration, you look at all the secrecy, is this administration even more secretive? Is this administration even less accessible, let's say, than they were during the Nixon administration in that quagmire? Two things to say about I'm going to answer your question. But, you know, we lost, we lost, Americans lost 58,000, two to three million Vietnamese. We don't even count, count the Iraqi dead, by the way. We've managed so totally to dehumanize them in this society, basically, except for a few people. Here's the thing about Vietnam that's the distinction that's really interesting to me. Anyway, this is my own, this, nothing's empirical here. 58,000 dead, millions killed. It was always a tactical war. It was a tactical mistake. The war ends. Our national security is not threatened. Uh, within a few years, Vietnam's making a lot of overtures. People like McCain, uh, hawk as he is, you know, there's nothing in you know, hawk. McCain's position on the war is pretty, pretty hardline. He's got a sense of integrity and honesty that's nice, but basically, you know, he's not going to lead us out of the wilderness on this. In any case, um, we opened relations with them very quickly, pretty quickly after the war. We diddled around it. They wanted us right away, and we're in big, great business. We do business tourism there. We trade with them. This is a strategic war of enormous consequences to us and long-standing consequences. Although the casualty figures are less, the enmity that we have created in the Arab world. Um, I had an Israeli about Abu Ghraib. After I did Abu Ghraib, I had an Israeli, uh, one of those Israelis, he's, you know, they treat Arabs like rocks. You drive you crazy, but there's a certain charm. This guy, he knows Arabic, he knows German. He's crawling on his belly in Damascus for Mossad, who knows how many years doing what. This guy said to me, he's an old timer, he said to me after those stories, it was an email, he said, you know, he said, I hate Arabs and I've been killing them for 40 or 50 years and they hate me and they've been killing me for 40 or 50 years, but we know that somewhere down the line we're going to have to live with those SOBs, whether there's a fence or a wall. I think Kerry has been taken to describe it as a white picket fence, is it? Something like that. I'm exaggerating, but Kerry seems to minimize that. The, the, the fawning over Israel that continues on both parties is really a little breathtaking, but anyway. Um, well, uh, it's part of our fabric now, and I'll tell you the consequences about that in a minute. Um, again, 
Um, and so uh, he said to me, if we, and as bad as we can be to individuals, but if we had treated our Arabs the way you treated them in Abu Ghraib, the sexual stuff, the photographs, we couldn't be able to have a peace. We couldn't live with them. He said, you guys, you do not begin to understand where you've put yourself in the Arab world. Middle class Muslims who like America, want to send their kids there, want to do trade with us, see us as a sexually perverted society. And it's a, it's a, this is a real hole we're in. And is this more, are we more secretive in this administration than say we were back in the Nixon administration, in your judgment? Is there less access to the press? They always want to keep secrets. They, everybody wants to keep secrets. And it's always sort of stunning how much, how much the, the people on the inside know that we don't know. I, I can only tell you, so I can't quantify it. I, I, clearly, um, um, they're extremely secretive. Uh, so was Nixon. Um, uh, um, what I find difficult is because um, um, the one thing I do is with my friends that talk to me, I'm a little square this way, uh, one of the reasons people talk to me is because I over-report everything. I, I over-report everything and, and I talk to many more people and I, I make a lot of differentiations about what I publish. I'm not suppressing anything, but often I'm not as specific. And so I like always when I have a sensitive story, a story about, you know, at the New York Times it was something we were all taught and the same at the New Yorker. Nobody wants to write a story that's going to cause enormous consequences for individuals. And so you always had, I've always had since I've been in Washington and since 64 with Johnson, I've always had people high up I could go to. And sometimes in some governments, it's the head of the National Security Agency, the no such agency. That's not true. They're there. They talk to you. This is the only administration, even in the days of Kissinger, my take on Kissinger is real simple. He lies like most people breathe, you know, and, then, and, um, and when the rest of us, no, it's a consistent take. When I mean, the rest of us, you know, we, we count sheep when we can't sleep. He's got to count burned, burned and maimed Cambodian babies the rest of his life. I don't know how he does it. In any case, nonetheless, with all that enmity, you could go mostly to Larry Eagleburger and say, here's what we have, and get a rational answer. Okay, you're going to kill us, do it, kill it, but save this line. You know, not try to suppress it, but try and really, this is the only administration where I, sometimes I have to go and take stories and I drive out to somebody I know who's a player who I can't talk to officially or even unofficially, and I leave it in his mailbox. I mean, the New Yorker closes on a Friday. I, I've driven out and put it in mailboxes on a Thursday night and said, you know, give me, give me the, you know, n n I want nothing more to, for him to say, uh, next week if you write it, we may be booby trapped, something like this. Once in a while I get that, most of the time not. So this is a government that's completely detached. Look, Bush, it's not hard to figure out, Bush said after 9-11, you're either with us or against us. And the way it worked out, within days, we all know the history now, they wanted Iraq. That was the mantra. And so the way it worked out is, um, if you supported them, in this insanity of thinking that the, the war on terror could be solved through Baghdad, you were a genius. If you dis I'm talking about inside the government. If you disagreed, um, you were a traitor. And what they did that most people don't realize, these little neocons purged before 9-11. They went in purging very early. They purged throughout the bureaucracy. I mean, the real story that could be done is you could sit down and take every agency and look at what's happened to it. And you'll see a, a, a tremendous de, a devaluation of the kind of principles that a lot of us stand for inside. I want to follow up with something on Kissinger, but one of your colleagues, Ken Aletta, for example, in a number of articles in The New Yorker, has pointed out that not only did that purge take place, but a kind of contempt for the press, which made it increasingly less and less accessible because of that contemptuousness and because of the kind of an iron wall that went down. I mean, that's pretty much how he described it, that the press just simply doesn't have access. The Bush administration doesn't even feel they have to talk to them like Larry Eagleburger talked to the press. No, they, this Bush administration, Henry Kissinger always made his goal. He was always successful because he understood no matter who else criticized him, if he had CBS, NBC, and ABC, and the New York Times, and the Washington Post, between the 49 and 50 yard line, he was home free. He could do anything else he wanted, as long as Catherine Graham played tennis with him or something, whatever, or invited him to dinner. He always understood that these guys couldn't care less about us. That is, the New York Times, the Washington Post, the major networks, they have their own system. They have their talk radio, they have their, their, seat, they have their cable television. They communicate differently than, than other presidencies. And so we really have a country that's on the verge 
you know, of, uh, you know, is it the north-south? No, but are we on the verge of some sort of civil breach? We're close to it. I think we're really in, in you know, I think the union's not in danger. Uh, but Bush has been really playing on that card. You know, he plays, tonight you saw that. He went after, you know, what is 70 million people don't believe in evolution. He went after that vote hard today. He locked down that vote. That's what he was doing today. He was locking down that vote. His base. You have said on a number of occasions, I believe, that Kissinger was a war criminal, not only for the bombing, secret bombings of Cambodia, but for the coup of Salvador Allende in Chile. Do we have, in your judgment, bona fide war criminals in this administration now? Who are they? I think there's been seriously war crimes committed in the prisons. And I think, look, you know, all you have to do is look at the chronology. It's not hard to look at the chronology. The Abu Ghraib stuff is sort of, it's well known enough I can just run down the chronology without getting too, too detailed. Okay, here's, here's what, it's really not hard. First of all, you have to understand from the very beginning, we dehumanized the, the other guys. You know, I mean, um, I don't want to shock anybody, but, you know, it's, I don't think it's unfair to say we're a reasonably racist country. Um, I always used to make one of my little pathetic jokes was that the one thing that made me like um, uh, Bill Clinton was that he was the first president since World War II to actually bomb white people, which he did in 95 or 96. But, you know, I mean, just as a fact, in Kosovo, just think of the wars, you know. It, and so, you know, you look at it that way. And, you know, look, it's hard for me not to get caught up in racism because of Milai. I mean, I did Milai. And, um, and I couldn't get, you know, it wasn't so easy. I couldn't get a friggin' newspaper to run it for a, a month. That's why we set up a news agency. I had been Eugene McCarthy's press secretary in 68 um, and wrote, wrote his speeches. I was running around with people like uh, Cal Lowell, my pal. You know, I was, you know, I was in, fats, it was exciting and fun. He was, a, a, you know, the anti-war candidate, clean, get clean for Gene. I knew everybody. I'd worked for the Associated Press. I'd written in 16, as a freelancer after the, working in the McCarthy campaign, I went back to, I'd written for Life magazine, the New York Times magazine, I'd written for a lot of stuff, no, no blemishes, nobody could do that story. In the end, I ended up thinking that the kids who did the killing were as much victims as the people they kill. I had a mother tell me, I went, I was talking about this the other day, I, 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 something about this, I got a call last week. Um, from a soldier. It's different now, a lot of communication, 800 numbers. Um, he, he was, he's an American officer and he was at a unit uh, halfway between Baghdad and, uh, and the Syrian border. Uh, it's a place where we claim we've done great work at cleaning out the insurgency. He was a platoon commander, first lieutenant, out of a major, you know, ROTC guy. And it was a, <laughs> it was a call about this. He had been bivouacking outside of town with his platoon, and it was near, it was an area of an agricultural area, and there was a granary around. And the, the guys that owned the granary, the Iraqis that owned the granary, it was, a, it was an area that the insurgency had some control, but it was very quiet, it's not Fallujah. It was a town that was off the mainstream, not much violence there. And um, uh, his guys, the, the guys that owned the granary had hired, my guess is from his language, I wasn't explicit, you know, we're talking not more than three dozen, 30, or so guards. Any kind of work people were dying to do. So Iraqis were guarding the granary. His troops were bivouac, were stationed there. They got to know everybody. You know, one thing about our kids and us, uh, we're nice. I, I go to the Middle East all the time. I don't know what people thought. People are great to me. I mean, not because they know who I am. They're just as a, you're an American, even in Damascus and places like that where there's a lot of tension, welcome, welcome. They all differentiate between Americans and the government. And, and, and it's, it's uh, I wouldn't tell you otherwise. And the Iraqis are great people, you know, and any, anybody who's been in the Middle East, you can't, you, you, they'll give you, you know, literally the last piece of bread, et cetera. So all those cliches, they're all true. So this guy, as the story involved, they were a couple weeks together, they know each other. Orders came down from the generals in Baghdad. We want to clear the village, like in Samarra. And as he told the story, another platoon from his company came and executed all the guards as his people were screaming, stop. And he said they just shot him one by one. And his people, he went nuts. His soldiers went nuts. He went, and he's hysterical. He's totally hysterical. He went to the captain. He's a, he's a lieutenant. He went to the company captain. The company captain said, 
No, you don't understand. That's a kill. We got 36 insurgents. You read those stories where the Americans, we took a city, we had a combat, and 150 insurgents killed. You read those stories. It's sage of Vietnam again, folks. Body count. And you know what I told him? I said, uh, I said, fella, I said, you've complained to the captain. He knows you think they committed murder. Your troops know that their fellow soldiers committed murder. Shut up. Just shut up. Get through your tour. Shut up. You're going to get a bullet in the back. You don't need that. And that's where we are with this war. It's going to be so corrupting. And that's, you know, and, and the other thing that's amazing about America today that I can tell you, I, I, I think it's here. I, I can't say. I, I, don't, I haven't talked to enough people, but I know in other places I've talked. Somehow we make these collective judgments that are amazing. And one of the judgments we made is unlike Vietnam, we're not mad at our soldiers. We're not angry at them. Think about it. We're not angry at them. We understand they're as much victims as the people they killed. We do in some visceral way, which is very interesting. We know that nobody in his right mind would want to be there. And so it's, it's, it's uh, I think the consequences and the sort of, uh, the anger that gets me is, who in the hell are these guys to come and do that to our society and to all of us? In Abu Ghraib, what happened was, we've been disappearing people. My government has a secret unit that since December of 2001 has been disappearing people just like the Brazilians and Argentinians did. Rumsfeld decided after 9-11 that we could not wait. The president assigned a secret finding. We have a team of people unmarked. They fly in unmarked planes. They fly in Gulf Streams. They have their own choppers. They, they you know, um, they, 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 they don't carry American passports and they just grab people. And you know, in the beginning, I can, maybe you can understand some rationale. We were frightened, we were scared after 9-11. Some of you might remember there was fear that the Sears Tower would be next. We didn't know. We, when you're, and this is what, of course, Bush plays on. So, so what happens is um, um, we're getting no intelligence from the prison population. The war in Baghdad goes bad. Um, the UN is blown up. Jordan's blown up. The embassy in Jordan is blown up. Pipelines are continue to be hit. Oil pipelines, it's a disaster. And oil's interesting because it could be a ticket out. I mean, if there's any hope, it could be if you can somehow get the sides to stop fighting and get the oil going. It's a lot of money there anyway. And, uh, um, but, but, and so all this is going on. Uh, in April, in August of, of 19, uh, 2003, last August, the insurgency is on. Rumsfeld's talking publicly about deadheads, the general deadheaders, and general, the generals, Abizade and others, are talking about uh, Sanchez. They're talking about 5,000 insurgents. Are the, uh, we got to get the 5,000. So they decide they're going to jack up the prison population. I'll tell you where the sex comes from. Let me assure you that a group of West Virginia reservists, MP reservists, uh, know nothing about the, 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 the sensitivity of, and the sense of shame in the Arab society. You know. We're we, we operate on guilt, they operate on shame. And so um, the idea, it's against the Koran. I keep on saying that, but I don't, I don't know. I don't have a New Yorker fact checker tell me that, but people have told me that. In the Koran, a man cannot be seen nude, a, an Arab man from the front. And the idea of photographing an Arab man and having him simulate homosexual activity and having um, a, a woman, American GI woman in the photograph is the end of society for them. It's the end of life. It's the equivalent of a woman, an Arab woman, um, um, having adultery or, li or having sex before marriage and all that. You know, this, it's their societal norms anyway. Uh, and so the team is brought in. We're really scared. We don't know where it's going. It's election year. This is all at the roves involved. This is, and how am I getting it? I'm getting it from people directly involved. And, you know, I, can I name them? Do I dare? No. Um, um, they, they bring the team in because the team's done one couple things. One of the things they've done is they've taken down some Arabs. The Israelis do it too in special cases with great success and certain people. You get them photographed. You get photographs that are blackmail. And you say to these people, men, in, in this, the idea behind Abu Ghraib, the intellectual premise is we're going to get some people from the prison population, which we know has very little information. Most of those people have nothing to do with the insurgency. We're going to say to young men, we're going to give you these pictures. We're going to say, here are the photographs. We want you to go home, find the insurgency, 
and start telling us about what's in it, or we're going to spread these photographs around every schoolmate. And you're, that was the idea. That was the that was the underlying principle, which wasn't irrational. I mean, it, it was that's the way it is. It got out of hand very quickly. This started in September, October. They brought the special team in over the objection of, of Rumsfeld brought it in. Rumsfeld. And don't forget, the president signed off on this. Rumsfeld brought it in with his man named Steve Cambone, a Claremont PhD, a Straussian, a neocon Straussian, if some of you know what I'm talking about, up to the gills. I mean, there is such things as Straussian and noble lies, and these are infected with some of these neocons. The idea that it's okay to tell a noble lie. Anyway, it's a digression. But So anyway, they, they, they brought the team in to train the kids. And the kids, the reservists, you know, when we send kids to fight in war, they're in local parentis, the soldiers, the military, the officers there, their job is, and it's a job many officers take very seriously, to protect our children from bombs and killing and maim, but also, is there anything more dangerous than an 18-year-old or 20-year-old kid with a weapon in a war zone? Is there anything more stupid, more vulnerable? You protect them from what, exactly what happened, what was going on, those photographs had been going on for, for months. It went on. Which is, forgive me, what you say that the American military abrogated, that sense of local parentis responsibility. It's a Keeping the kids from themselves, from harming themselves. It's a failure of enormous proportions. That, and, but let me, just the chronology is fascinating to me. Anyway, um, it goes on. The CIA pulls out because they know it's insanity. The CIA is not averse to killing people. They pulled out in, in November. And everything I'm telling you is it's just there. And in January, one of the kids in the unit has had it with all the stuff he's seeing. They're passing the photographs around. See, this is a modern generation. They're burning the CD, you know. In my generation, you brought home little pictures you put behind the socks. When I was in the Army in the 60s, you put, you know, put them behind the socks. You know, those little porn pictures or whatever they are. Um, and your weed. <laughs> and, you know, now these kids pass the stuff around. And so, on CD-ROM, they were burning it. And so, Rumsfeld, they, they, they started an investigation. Rumsfeld, according to the official chronology, by January, mid-January, there's three, three 4,000 court marshals a year. Somehow this seemed to be so important that he took it to the president within two days. He said he never saw the pictures. So we know the president by mid-January gets it. What happens next? What happens next is nothing until I get, CBS had the pictures, didn't publish them. Eventually I got a hold of them and the Tagubu report, this wonderful report that was not made for publication, which is why it's so good. In May or late April, the stuff gets published. Early, right around May 1st. So for four months, these men, these men who ran the government, these officers, these civilians knew what was going on, knew how bad it had been. And did they do anything? No. It wasn't until the stories became public that they assigned another general. Uh, they sent out another general, a guy named Miller from Guantanamo, to do what he could and talked about cleaning up stuff. I mean, it's, it's not even hard to see the culpability. For four months, they did nothing except prosecute seven kids who had the misfortune to be in the photographs. Miss uh, England may get 38 years as a result of that process. It drives me crazy. I mean, look, she, she's guilty of a lot. Bad judgment, idiot. She was a, ran a pizza parlor as a, before she was an MP. And you know, after I did the stories, you know, you talk about um, um, the kids in Milai being not as, as, as victims. After I did the stories in the New Yorker, two things happened. One, people who worked for Condoleezza Rice told me the stuff that I begin the book about, about these meetings early in 2000, middle of 2002, the White House knew all about this, of course. I mean, come on, let's, let's not get realistic. They didn't know the detail. Rumsfeld didn't know about Abu Ghraib, you know, all the craziness, but he certainly knew what was going on in the prison system. Um, but I also get guys who worked in the White House and the CIA talking to me of enormous concern about this lack of integrity at the top. But I also get, I, I, I'll tell you what I get. There's a... Uh, I was thinking about it today. There's a wonderful Nathaniel West novel called Miss Lonely Hearts. Anybody, you know, it's Day of the Locals, Miss Lonely Hearts. It's about a, a, a columnist in, uh, he died, what, in 1937? He only wrote four novels, Dream Life of Basil Snell. Anyway, he wrote a novel about a, a love, a love a, one of those love, love, Ann Landers types reporters. Uh, he wrote a, this guy, his name was Stryker, I think, or that was the editor. He, he wrote a column, a love column in the, the Chronicle or whatever. Miss Lonely Hearts never has a name. I put on my literature hat here, uh, my literature teacher hat. It's it, never given a name. Shrike, Shrike is the, uh, the editor. Is the editor. Is yeah. the editor. Yeah. I don't know. That's right. Okay. You remember the book. Okay. And in the column, one of the things, they're having a drink, and he's talking over drinks about the, a letter he got today. And he said, uh, the not unnamed protagonist said, he said, you know, I got this amazing letter today. He said, a young girl, she said, I'm 17 or 16. She said, I have 
I'm five foot seven, and what people tell me with beautiful long blonde hair, and everybody tells me I have a very curvaceous figure, and I'm very, you know, absolutely lovely. And no boy has ever talked to me, nobody has ever asked me for a date. Do you think it's because I have no nose? Okay? So I sometimes think about that. I do these articles, a mother calls me up from the middle of New Jersey. Okay, here's her story. She's got a kid that was in the unit in Abu Ghraib. She didn't know what Abu Ghraib was until my articles. The kid comes home from the end, I'm one year detour, she's a reservist, one year, comes back from a duty and as a prison guard, she doesn't know where she is, and um, comes back, and comes back in April, March or April, before the stuff became public, leaves her young husband, moves by herself, seems to be, the, it's her, she's not a sophisticated woman, so it's hard for her to articulate, but she's certainly severely depressed, clinically depressed, and uh, mo just, starts going on weekends and getting her body tattooed in black. Big black tattoos. And she can't understand it. And after the Milais, after this epigree, which she knew about just casually because she you know, was all over the news, she, she inadvertently, this wasn't deliberate, the, she had given her daughter a computer, a, one of those, uh, a, a, a little computer to take to the war with a DVD so she could watch movies. I think a lot of the kids do that. So, and the daughter, when she returned, left it, the computer that she hadn't looked at. It was a second computer. And so one day she just decided to clean it out. And there was a file marked Iraq. And she hit the button and outpoured, I mean, famine, death, pestilence, outpoured this stuff. And so you say to yourself, you know, it's, it, it's just overwhelming what we've done. It's just overwhelming what these guys are doing. It's devastating. And so, I go and see her. What can I say to her? We didn't publish the pictures. We didn't do much. Uh, uh, Dave Remnick, it's, you know, uh, there's stuff out there. It's so bad, you know, again, countenanced. I'm not saying Rumsfeld knew about it. It's just, we went to war with a society we didn't understand that frightened us, and we did everything wrong. What do you make of the, oh, and I'll get to some questions because we have lots of them from the audience and, and do as many as we can. Time we're now at 10.30 or something like that. Just yeah. a couple of quick questions though. What do you make of the, of the Bremer uh, issue st statement about Rumsfeld? I remember novelist Jane Smiley telling me that Rumsfeld was trying to run the war like a CEO and now we have Bremer saying there simply weren't enough boots on the ground, there weren't enough troops and oh, oh, that was deadly. Don't you know what Bremer's now done? He's now completely disavowed what he said. He's now gone back to the church seeking redemption. He said, you know, he's now, he's, he's straight, and he wants to be blessed again. So he's now, he had an article on yesterday or the day before his New York Times saying, this, what I, let me tell you what I really meant. But the, he did say that. Yes. Look, everybody, everybody, everybody in the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the LA, by the way, a lot of reporters did all that. Here's the trouble with me being so critical, and the reason I hate to do it, because by implication I'm saying, ah, you know, and that's crazy. That's, that's kind of, there's tremendous reporters. There were a lot of people who did really first-rate stuff. In general, uh, I fault the editors because I think the editors were more frightened than anybody else. As, uh, this is, I certainly know at the New York Times they were, in my opinion. So I think we've had a, a real close down, a real, you know, I think the networks got cowed by it. It's not that reporters didn't want to do it, um, but the fact is... Just lack of backbone. You know, I, uh, in 74, you mentioned this story. I did a story, uh, I learned in 1973, all during Watergate, that the CIA had been spying in violation of all agreements and understandings on American anti-war students. And the way I really learned about the story, what I first was told, they were really going after African Americans. Stokely Carmichael was one target. We had the CIA running operations in America against black radicals. And so it took me a long time. It was secondary, you know, I, as, as important as it was, we had Watergate going. And I eventually found a terrific guy, a couple terrific guys who knew a lot about it. And one decent guy told me all about it. Told me this horrific story of what the CIA had been doing, that Johnson had started them. Lyndon Johnson, who, you know, uh, um, I know history wants that. We all want to say if it had been for Vietnam, we would, would have been a great president. But Johnson started this spying on his opposition this horrific stuff using the American CIA, it was just beyond belief. Anyway, um, and, uh, and so all this stuff was coming to me and I wrote a piece about it, but before I did, I jumped the guy. And I said to this guy, what 
the hell were you thinking of? You're, in, you're, you're a good guy. You know about this stuff. They're doing this kind of crap. You, why didn't you do something about it inside? This guy was not without some power inside the agency. And he said to me, <laughs> he said, this is, he, he told me, here's what he said. He said, remember the famous, a lot of you don't remember this because the communists, those days of communism weren't so important, but now, remember the famous 1956 party congress in Moscow where, where Khrushchev made Stalin an unperson. Do they still study this? Anybody study communism anymore? You know? They, okay, well, there was a famous party conference in 56 in which Khrushchev made a speech denouncing Stalin, and the, the, you know, who died in 53 as a, a non-person, and really denouncing him in strong terms, uh, before the, the, the Comintern or the Politburo, and, and one of the delegates stood up. This is what the guy says in response to my question. And one of the delegates stood up and said, hey, Comrade Khrushchev, where were you when the speak out at, speak out at day meant you were that night on a train going east? Where would you to where to stand on a street corner and read a poem? Or read some, you know, read some uh, translated Western work? Where were you when our grandmothers and grandfathers were sent off? Where were you when to be Jewish meant the NKVP took you away at night? Where were you? And Khrushchev, this, I'm still in this guy's voice, Khrushchev at that moment went like this at the lectern. Who said that? That's what the guy says to me. Who said that? Who said that? He waits about 30 seconds, total silence. And then my friend says to me, that's where I was. And so I think what Bush has done has done that to us. He's put us into the silence. I also say a lot that it's like that wonderful Richard Pryor bit where Richard Pryor is in bed with his wife's best friend doing it and she walks in and he said, it's not what you see. This is what you know. He said, listen, honey, he said, are you going to believe your, your lion eyes or me? And Bush's, <laughs> Bush's position is basically, are you going to believe me or what you see every day and what everybody tells you? He's put us all in that prior joke. We're all one little pieces in the prior joke. So we've got, actually, uh, I want to. All right, I'll stop. No, no, no. That, that, well, thank you.